My name is Leo Bridgewater, and I was a specialist in the United States Army. I was uh, born and raised right here in the city of Trenton, New Jersey, where I'm currently living. And um, the way I got uh, started with uh, cannabis activism is a number of friends who have attempted suicide and were successful and actually had a hand in helping of another battle buddy of mine's uh, avoid being successful with his attempt with suicide. Um, and being that a majority of my friends are still in service and wearing the uniform, um, and we're at 22 veteran suicides a day, uh, five a week here in the state of New Jersey. And at this point, you know, we now have more Vietnam veterans who have come home and committed suicide than actually died in the war. And we're talking over 58,000. And the crazy part is, is that we passed that number years ago. It's, it's unacceptable. And so, um, you know, given that, you know, a lot of the people whom I love are still in service, it's just, when you come from that place, uh, that's where, you know, um, you know my, uh, my motivation uh, for cannabis legalization starts with, because we're in the midst of an opioid abuse and addiction epidemic. And, you know, it's something, you know, opioid abuse is not uh, foreign to the veteran uh, population. But through activism and, and also working alongside people who have much deeper and big and, 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 and uh, more daunting uh, conditions than I do, and you get a chance to actually sit down and talk to them, you know, it, it, it gives a whole new meaning to the idea. I used to complain about not having shoes until I met a man who had no feet. I'm actually one of the uh, three veterans who testified in Senate committee to have uh, PTSD added to our state's medical marijuana program in September of 2016, Governor Chris Christie uh, signed our bill into law. And so we've been able to expand uh, the New Jersey medical marijuana program to include post-traumatic stress disorder. My name is Leo Bridgewater. I served three tours of duty in the Army. Upon the end of my tour and my return home, I began to suffer from PTSD. Medical marijuana has allowed me to get my life back on track. I'm speaking for every single uh, veteran, uh, every single medical marijuana patient, and every single consume cannabis consumer who doesn't even know that they're, they're medicating. Before I became an activist, um, I was a casual cannabis uh, consumer. And I was actually, I, I would even go as far as to say I was a, a, a selfish cannabis consumer. Um, because the only person I thought about was myself at the time, you know, consuming. And so personally, I, I actually started admitting to the, the, the VA that I consumed cannabis uh, before uh, we got PTSD added to the state's medical marijuana program. Because at that point, you know, I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, this, is, this is my medicine. And, you know, like the direction in which they were steering me was, more so in the direction of, you know, turning me into an addict than anything else. You know, what cannabis has done for me is it's taken me from suffering from PTSD to living with PTSD. And that means all the, that means everything to me. It means the world to me. You know, I'm, I'm able to be uh, functional. You know, I'm able to uh, be coherent and involved and I have feelings. And see, when you're on a cocktail of opioids, you know, you're numb. It's like you're watching yourself. You're in a constant state of a movie. You know, you see yourself moving. You just don't feel yourself moving. You see yourself uh, doing, you know, um, risky behavior or whatever. And you know you're, you're aware of what your thoughts are, but you're not really, you don't feel them. It's almost like you're, it, it is the, the zombie effect. And so when it came time to uh, admit to the VA that I do, in fact, uh, consume cannabis and would prefer to consume cannabis over any type of opioids, uh, uh, you know, any type of the, you know, the fentanyl, the oxycodone, the Percocets. And, and let me tell you, you know, like they're passing those pills out at the VA like it's candy. 
you know i mean it's bad you know um but it's also in line with the traditional ways in which we uh, approach uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, we medicate our way out of it in terms of with those, those prescription drugs. Um, now with the VA having changed its stance, because before, you know, you couldn't say those things. Um, you couldn't even say, you couldn't even talk about uh, having PTSD uh, even when you're, when I was in only because that, you know, you could lose your security clearance. I mean, they tell you they don't take your clearance, but we all know better. And so, you know, it's best you just don't say anything. And in the meantime, you're still, you know, suffering with this, uh, condition. The VA has now taken a stance. Whereas if you live in a state that has a medical marijuana program, then they're not going to hold it against you. Um, but if you do, they will. So there are consequences. It just depends on whether you live in a state that has a medical marijuana program versus a state that doesn't. And even if you live in a state that does have a medical marijuana program, the VA doctors are very ill-equipped to be able to um, uh, make the kind of recommendations or not, or at least likely to make those recommendations because it's something that they're not very uh, well educated on. And so there's still the stigma you know, that is alive and well and kicking. And it has played a part in the, 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 the VA's willingness to recommend folks to, the, to, to whatever state's medical marijuana program. And on top of that, you got to jump through a lot of hoops. The veteran population and the general population are actually running parallel with each other. Um, it just gets more, more, garners more of a, a, a attention because it's the veteran population. So those who will live in those states, you know, who are contemplating, you know, what do you do and how do you get started? I honestly like, you know, lesson learned, I would say start off with getting your veteran population involved. We're a powerful, powerful tool, a powerful resource. And the thing about it is, is that just think of it in terms of if you're a tax paying citizen of the United States, you pay for this. And so getting your veteran population involved and, and, and putting them in the forefront, they're a much more powerful tool. My experience, and I've been up and down this state talking to different municipalities and, and, and so on and so forth and being in all different kinds of committees. I was just in the assembly oversight committee testifying last night. And, you know, when I am, as a, as a, as a veteran, what I'm learning is that you know, when you look at the current racial and political climate of this country, the general population nowadays tend to lean more towards the word of a veteran than a politician. And I believe it's because, you know, from my experience in the, in the state house, that when I'm inside that state house, because I'm a veteran, see, they talk to me different than the general population. Everybody in the United States has a line that even they won't cross. And the ill treatment and disrespect of a veteran happens to be one of those lines that all Americans just won't cross. You know, um, the men and women of the United States military in totality make up less than 1% of the general population, yet they do 100% of all the fighting. And when you have people say, thank you for your service, um, people thank you for your service in many different ways. Um, and one of those ways is the amount of time and attention I'm given whenever I go into the state house and actually talk to an assemblyman or assemblywoman. Um, it's different when you're asked upon, the called upon to actually testify in a committee or give your opinions and talk about the things that are happening. I want to thank Leo Bridgewater for being here today uh, to put a human face to our actions and also, uh, in addition to that, thank you for your service to the nation. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention at this point, and I just want to reemphasize that, you know, we're not just talking about a cultural shift or facilitating a cultural shift and how we view this plant. 
but we're also talking about a, tra a massive, massive transfer of wealth, the likes of which the logistics almost cannot be quantified. And so education is the key thing. And if you want to know more, if you want to know how to get in touch with me, uh, you can actually uh, find me on uh, www.njcannabiscommission.org. Um, you can also find me at uh, Leo Bridgewater on Facebook and also on Instagram, Leo Bridgewater. I reach out uh, if there's any way that I can be of service in terms of, uh, again, you know, helping you with your, you know, facilitating your blueprint and, you know, offering up ideas and also letting you know where our next events are going to be. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys and, you know, um, to the Cannabis Re Reporter Show, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your service uh, to uh, your veteran population because we need you guys too and this is such a blessing and I thank you so much for everything.